Data security pioneers saw the value of penetration testing 60 years ago, but as both offensive and defensive technologies improve, it has never been more important. Pen testing is about 80% automation and about 20% art. A lot of the initial amateur pen testing, it still goes on today, are by security enthusiasts who want to make sure that things are more secure. As companies have evolved, security pen testing has become part and parcel to a security program. Business is booming in the global penetration testing market, which is pegged to exceed $5 billion U.S. dollars annually by 2031, according to Cybersecurity Ventures. One recent study found that over 80% of companies had increased their budgets for the practice, speaking to just how much of a need there is for proactive security measures. There's no point putting security in place if you don't test it. Penetration testing is about checking your work, making sure that as you're building systems, as you're implementing systems, as you're loading them with data, that's pretty sensitive, that you're taking the appropriate precautions to protect it against the people that would want to break in. However, as technology continues to evolve, so will cybercrime, with damages predicted to hit $10.5 trillion annually by 2025. Being able to run pen tests as often as you can allows an organization to understand and their security posture today, how it got better or how it will get better over time, and then report back out to the board, to auditors, to regulators. With so many businesses only getting serious about penetration testing now, you'd be forgiven to think the practice had emerged in recent years. But the reality is that the concept has been around for much longer. I think about the history of pen testing across several arcs or storylines. The military arc, the ethical hacking arc, and the unethical hacking arc. The first storyline is hacker culture. It was about people that were tech savvy, that were curious, and that were defiant for authority. Anytime someone says hacker, you have this connotation of evil doers, but it's not always so. The reason that we call them white hat and black hat is from the old westerns of the day. In a black and white western, the good guys always wear white hats and the bad guys always wear black hats, so you can tell them apart. And uh, that's nomenclature that we use to this day. In April of 1967, Rand Corporation engineer Willis H. Ware shared a seminal paper to more than 15,000 security experts gathered at the annual Joint Computer Conference in Atlantic City, New Jersey. It would become a manifesto in the cybersecurity industry for its recognition of the importance of penetration testing from day one. Initially, computers were so expensive and so large, they were for big businesses and governments. And he's basically saying that the value of private information to an outsider will determine the resources he's willing to expend to acquire it. And the value of information to its owner is related to what he's willing to pay to protect it. At the time, Ware warned that many companies were likely to underinvest in data security, which would not only leave them exposed to attacks from outsiders, but also weaken whatever security defenses were already in place. That was a pretty significant change just to lay down some rules and some thinking about the risk to data and the, the need for security that's commensurate with the importance of the data, as opposed to simply saying, oh, we're just going to block people from coming in and that will be enough. Heeding the warning about a dangerous, rapidly emerging state of play, RAND and government agencies partnered to assemble Tiger Teams, borrowing a term from the space and military complex. Their response came in the form of a system called Multix, the Multiplex Information Computing Service, which was launched by the U.S. Air Force in 1974 and later executed one of the first White Hat attacks. Military Tiger Teams were really the precursor to Red Teams and ethical hackers today. And what these Military Tiger Teams did was use their bespoke and unique technical expertise to break into facilities and break into mission command systems. And so these Tiger teams did what other military organizations do, which is look at their environment through the eyes of the adversary. Traditional military processes, when you put together your battle plans, you turn the map around and you red team those battle plans. You look at those plans through the eyes of the attacker so you can understand and see what they see. And it's a way to verify that your battle plans are going to survive first contact. Well, there was no equivalent of that in cybersecurity and in mission command systems. And these Tiger teams in the 70s really started to become that first foray into looking at your cyber terrain through the eyes of the attacker. That testing turned up a number of vulnerabilities, allowing Multics engineers to fix the problems before they could be exploited by malicious outsiders, such as nation state actors. Mm -hmm. 
Awareness of the immense potential of computers naturally attracted curious hackers, such as Steve Wozniak and the late Kevin Mitnick, who came of age as part of a new generation for whom computers were less of a novel development and more a technology that promised to change the world. In the 80s, there was a lot more visibility about penetration testing as a field, and it started to become a professional area where experts would come in. Part of the reason that they did that was not just because they were developing their skills, but because in 1986, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act was introduced. And this is the first legislation that formally laid down penalties for hacking systems. The personal computer revolution of the 1980s brought computing and networking technology to the forefront alongside long predicted complications for data security. All the while, pioneers including Peter Norton and John McAfee began establishing security brands that would shape the next 40 years. What you saw in hacker culture in the 90s was this realization that e-commerce and the internet was a financial engine. And there were opportunities to disrupt commerce, to disrupt business operations, steal money, and so on. And you started to see the professionalization of that hacker community through the 90s. Internet companies started to hire consultants to come in and do professional penetration testing type services. You saw the emergence of Satan, Whereas pen testing was largely conducted on a hobby or individual practitioner basis in the 1980s, as technology progressed, its evolution transformed it into a powerful tool in the consulting world. In 1995, security researcher Dan Farmer and programmer Weetzi Venema took a major step by releasing the freely available security administrator tool for analyzing networks, also known as Satan. Satan was a problem for any company that thought they were secure because it would automatically go in and probe the network and test vulnerabilities. It would check whether there were open ports that you could use to access a, a client environment, whether there were vulnerabilities in protocols that were emerging at the time. This is the early days of the internet as we know it and the open internet. And so there were quite a lot of vulnerabilities to find and Satan really helped. Over time, Satan fell out of use, but the paradigm it established spawned tools such as Nmap, Nessus, Sarah, and Saint. What you saw was this shift from kind of bespoke artists executing penetration tests to a robust and, and reasonably standardized library of attacker tools that could be used by other attackers. And this was controversial because those attacker tools could also be used by the bad guys to execute malicious activity. Around the time was more of the pinnacle or where penetration testing took off. Those type of tools allowed people who didn't have a ton of technical capability the chance to test certain environments and to see if they could get into it using some of those automated fashion. This idea that you can automate the pen testing, get a system to check against a list of known vulnerabilities, a list of known problems that could potentially be in your environment, and see just how well you hold up to a bit of probing and a bit of scrutiny by the systems. And it's become so much more important that this be automated and be available for people to access as they need. The early years of this century saw the steady codification of pen testing as a discipline, with developments such as 2003's OWASP Web Security Testing Guide, which outlined methodological frameworks for the practice that are still in use today. This laid the groundwork for the you know, cloud environments that we're using now. By 2009, formalization of these standards, also known as the Penetration Testing Execution Standard, or PTES, worked to translate what had been a highly technical practice into the business sphere, as they provided not only technical standards, but aimed to help businesses understand the value of penetration testing through a seven-layer model. That includes pre-engagement interactions, intelligence gathering, threat modeling, vulnerability analysis, exploitation, post exploitation and reporting. That standard really spelled out the way that pen testing was meant to happen. It's pretty significant because it allowed companies to set up a capability based on those seven steps. And at the end of that, you go back and do it again. Over time, the industry has developed specific standards for pen testing in various situations. The payment card industry, for example, has its own requirements, as does healthcare. As regulatory requirements have come forth, they have given us the ability to not only test and say, okay, now we know that these vulnerabilities exist. Now we know that there are ways an attacker can get in. We have to do something about it. I expect everyone is doing some degree of penetration testing today. From dynamic code testing to the engagement of red teams, I expect most large firms to have a penetration test team that is working every day 
with the application developers to make sure that any production change that goes into the environment, it gets pen tested before it goes out and faces the public. Although the cybersecurity industry has now standardized penetration testing and built on professionalism to sell the concept to businesses, the increased use of automated tools has paradoxically made companies more vulnerable. As we've gone to automated pen testing, as we've gone to fantastic scanning tools like Nessus, those tools provide a ton of great information, but you still have to vet out and have a manual activity or a manual expert to validate that it really is a risk to your organization and weigh it out appropriately. And if you're not a good experienced penetration tester, you can't do that art side of penetration testing, which gives us the real result and sets off the alerts that the MSSP or other cybersecurity defenders are going to be able to see. Cybersecurity associations now offer a range of pen testing certifications to help security practitioners formalize their capabilities, including CompTIA Pentest Plus, EC Council Certified Ethical Hacker, and Licensed Penetration Tester, among others. When I think about kind of summarizing the history of pen testing, at the human level, we started in the pen testing world and said as the defiant, but really they were bespoke artists. It was their ability to understand how to reverse engineer a system, find vulnerabilities and take advantage of it for whatever their motivations were. But you see this shift from bespoke artists to automated tools or at least standardized tools that allow a less skilled attacker to be able to execute some form of recon and attack to now this era of autonomous tooling or autonomous attack where it's humans by exception. And I think the reason why that shift has become so important in this autonomous pen testing era is there's only about 20 to 25,000 certified ethical hackers globally. It takes about 10 years to become a senior penetration tester. And so what we have is extremely constrained supply in the world of ethical hacking. And the only way to meet the spike in demand is through some sort of force multiplier like AI, like autonomous attack and autonomous tooling. Just as automated pen testing and PTAS offerings have allowed companies to test security more frequently, the emergence of generative AI is disrupting the industry as both white hat and black hat teams lean on the technology to support their work. What's happening is if the pen testers, you know, sort of use the Gen AI engines to analyze their findings, pull out the main trends in the data that's been found and really give people an idea of their exposure in ways that would take a lot of time for humans to do. The other thing that generative AI can do is that they can develop test scenarios based on what's going on in the environment so they can iterate. One recent study by Australian and Indian academics, for example, evaluated the use of the ChatGPT 3.5 large language model during penetration testing and found amazing results that produced better pen testing reports. Gen AI, the researcher said, proved adept at analyzing historical records of attack vectors and mimicking human-like behavior, helping security teams better understand and anticipate the tactics real attackers may employ. The toolset may have changed, but many of the dynamics of today's pen testing environment would come as no surprise to Ware, who passed away in 2013, as cybersecurity was finally and meaningfully moving from the IT department to the boardroom. I think it's important for people to know when they look back across the history of pen testing that a lot of the ideas have been there for a long time. This is not a novel idea. This is not something that's strange. It's part of computer systems engineering and it, it makes sense. And time has shown that people that are engaging with pen testing, companies that are investing with pen testing, really produce more secure environments. My theory is if you don't go and find the weaknesses, then there's somebody out there who's gonna find those for you. Hopefully it's an auditor or the worst case will be a malicious actor who actually wants to show you what they can do with it. I think we're gonna see this burden or demand for improving your security posture over time, not only a board level conversation, but a cyber insurance level conversation and a national security level conversation. And so I think those in the original hacker culture in the 80s that used their skills for good had pushed this boulder uphill of using the world of offense to help surface the importance of cybersecurity, which is really what they did through the 90s and the 2000s. And I think if any of those original folks look at where we are today, the fact that cybersecurity Security is a board level conversation as a presidentially appointed position in the White House focused on our cybersecurity posture as a nation. I think they would be proud of the fact that we built this cybersecurity posture as a nation off of their backs. And I think understanding the history of pen testing allows us to understand where we need to take the role of pen testing and cybersecurity going forward.
This production was brought to you by Horizon3.ai, an autonomous security platform on a mission to turn the map around, using the attacker's perspective to help enterprises prioritize defensive efforts. To learn more about our sponsor, visit Horizon3.ai.